what I wanted to do is repair the earth. So I invented a system called permaculture, which everything you do is sustainable. Your agriculture, your fisheries, your housing, your, your, your towns. And I set out to teach it. Civilization. After some years, 20 or 30 years, I had taught three or four hundred thousand people. And for about every 700, I got a teacher from them. We go to a place which is a desert and there's hunger and starvation. And we go back in two years' time, and there's a jungle of food and people are happy and healthy. You realise that you can do it. You can make make paradise out of the earth. And for the millennium... You can truly say that's attributable to the, uh, the tireless work of Bill Mollison and his uh, you know, charismatic um, uh, character and... Um, his work around the world, the but the, the concept itself uh, clearly want. is more He's than done. just um, uh, Bill Mollison's uh, promotion and spread of it. Last year, 25 years after Permaculture One, Holmgren, the quietly spoken Green Revolutionary, published his revamped version of Permaculture. Since then, he's been on the speaking circuit, spreading the gospel and continuing his environmental design work here and abroad. I think David in particular uh, is a bit of an unsung hero. Um, he was, in my view, perhaps the, the, sl the slightly more softly spoken of the, of the pair. And I'm very glad to see that in the last few years, and particularly with his latest publication, that he's getting some of the recognition I think he deserves, because I really do think that he's got a very profound message for us, whether we're small farmers, whether we're gardeners, or whether we've got very large properties. So how has permaculture influenced broadacre agriculture? Again, it's difficult to measure. You see evidence of the permaculture movement out there in broadacre agriculture behind the scenes a bit in regards to uh, the whole farm planning phenomena, for example, and certainly the multifunctional use of, of, of trees and shrubs. I think that's probably the most visible edge of it that, that I've noted on the landscape. But uh, I guess it's, it's, it's something that you, you need to look closely at to be able to discern. Uh, and the, 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 the integration, I guess, of, of crops and animals and mixed farms and uh, multifunctional production systems. I think all bear the hallmarks of permaculture. permaculture book, uh, At nearby Blampede, Rod May, one of Australia's most prominent and successful farming. organic farmers, a runs a mixed farm producing food. livestock, yeah. wine and a mainstay of organic fresh vegetables grown using permaculture principles. Well, we grow three different varieties here at the moment, Tim. We've got red potatoes, white potatoes and yellow potatoes, which seem to be what the organic consumer uh, enjoy and uh, we grow these on a five-year rotation uh, along with pasture and some cereals in amongst our trees and uh, uh, we irrigate of course. I think, uh, I think that with permaculture on the surface we can see the very obvious way that uh, biophysical systems can be integrated on the farm level and we've seen that here on our farm but the other side of permaculture that is not so easily seen, and I'm not sure if it was ever one of the intended ideas of permaculture with Mollison and um, David Holmgren, but that is the, the economic integration that we've seen on our farm in particular, where we've got multiple products uh, coming from different uh, production systems, and over the years there's been a tremendous amount of insulation against uh, variations in the market, and in that sense I think permaculture's got a very valuable lesson for farmers in the 21st century. Senior CSIRO scientist Ted Lafroy, based in Perth, specialises in perennial farming systems and their impact on profitability and the environment. Last year he won a major prize for his research into the environmental sustainability of grain growing. He believes permaculture is now permeating mainstream agriculture. We can now see uh, major uh, research programs um, millions of dollars a year on programs such as redesigning Australia's agricultural landscapes. Uh, that was a major one from a few years ago. I don't think many of the scientists involved in it would have acknowledged 
or recognised that they were dealing with permaculture principles, but in essence they were. These days Bill Mollison has moved back to Tasmania, where the permaculture movement originated. At 49, his former star pupil has assumed a greater role in promoting their environmental doctrine. If people are gardeners and have grown some of their own food, they actually understand enough of what's involved that they're actually prepared to pay a, a reasonable price for good land management. If people are completely disconnected from, from that, uh, they are really dismissive of uh, the issues to do with uh, long-term sustainability. So ironically, uh, self-reliance, uh, home food production that could be argued is competition for commercial agriculture is actually provides the social foundation for which we can have sustainable agriculture in this country. I think what he has done is been able to synthesise an academic or intellectual quality, if you like, with a fairly practical and pragmatic approach. It's, it's a, a bold effort in many respects that I think he's uh, carried out in his more recent publication, for example. But he does seem to be able to bridge the gap, I think, between how you do it uh, and why you do it and the actual nuts and bolts of doing it. Across Australia, there are housing estates now built on permaculture principles and several permaculture institutes. They're being applied from uh, poor third world villages to um, uh, settlement towns on the edge of the big booming cities of uh, the third world through to um, affluent communities in Europe and uh, America. Permaculture's appeal and acceptance has waxed and waned, but many foresee its growing appeal. You look at the energy efficiency of industrial agriculture, it often, we often burn up more calories producing something than they are worth themselves. That can't go on forever. The real price of wheat has been declining worldwide for the last 200 years. Things are tough uh, in, in agriculture and we've got to look at every way of being smarter in how we interact with, with the Australian landscape and uh, how we use scarce resources. We're going to be dealing with global oil peak, which really means the end of cheap oil in this decade. And potentially, I think we can see a lot of good things come out of that because we'll also see inevitably commodity prices rise and the chance of farmers getting a better return for what they produce. Uh, and I think part of that is going to be the community having to come to terms with where resources come from um, and being prepared to pay for those. I think it's a wake-up call to how we interact with nature. Uh, the, the way that we use natural resources for human purposes, we've come unstuck in a lot of ways and permaculture is a real lesson about understanding the nature of place and designing and fitting in with where you live. Um, I think that's the lesson that we're still learning from permaculture. Overall, agriculture is less sustainable than it was when we wrote Permaculture One. The overall situation is what works.